I would like now to look for a few moments uh, at the mystical theology of Dennis and uh, his expression of apophatic prayer. In chapter 5 of the mystical theology, I, I'm sure Dennis has his tongue in his cheek as he's doing this and um, uh, is even taking a kind of a, of a, of a sadistic delight in the scandal that uh, he uh, uh, is uh, about to perpetrate. I read this uh, two years ago. I was giving a, a talk on the cloud of unknowing at the Open Center in Greenwich Village in New York to a rather mixed bag of, of people. And uh, I remember one man who came with a friend of mine uh, in the middle of this, got up and walked out. And he stayed out in, until I was finished. And you know, about two hours later, he stayed around. He came back to apologize. And he says, but I just couldn't handle what you were doing to God. Uh, and you'll see what I mean in a moment. Um, but, and it's interesting, too, because Dennis, in chapter 5 of his mystical theology, uses the word it, referring to God. And I, I, until recently, whenever I quoted this, I couldn't do it myself. And I would say God instead of it. You know, he said, it is not, it is not, it is. And I would say, God is not, God is not, God. But to be authentic, you have to use the it of Dennis. And you'll see what I mean as I read this. Chapter 5, that the supreme cause of every conceptual thing, everything that can be thought of, is not itself conceptual, is not thinkable. So you right away, you're starting out with, God is unthinkable. Uh, and here's what Dennis says. Again, as we climb higher, we say this, it, meaning God, it is not soul or mind, nor does it possess imagination, conviction, speech, or understanding. Nor is it speech per se, understanding per se. It cannot be spoken of, and it cannot be grasped by understanding. It is not number or order, greatness or smallness, equality or inequality, similarity or dissimilarity. It is not immovable, moving, or at rest. It has no power, it is not power, nor is it light. It does not live, nor is it life. It is not a substance, nor is it eternity or time. It cannot be grasped by the understanding, since it is neither knowledge nor truth. It is not kingship, it is not wisdom. It is neither one nor oneness, divinity nor goodness. Nor is it a spirit in the sense in which we understand that term. Now he's starting to apologize. He's getting a little afraid himself. <laughs> it is not sonship or fatherhood, and it is nothing known to us or to any other being. It falls neither within the predicate of non-being nor of being. You can't even say of it, it is not being, it is not non-being. Existing beings do not know it as it actually is. And of course, that's a statement that God is so beyond and so completely other that we can only speak of him by, by analogy, by metaphor, you see. Uh, and that's positive theology. Existing beings do not know it as it actually is, and it does not know them as they are. There is no speaking of it, nor name, nor knowledge of it. Darkness and light, error and truth, it is none of these. It is beyond assertion and denial. We make assertions and denial of what is next to it, but never of it because it is beyond every assertion. Being the perfect and unique cause of all things, again, he's betraying himself, because he, he can't even handle it, you see. He is not the unique. It is not the unique and a cause of all things. You see. And by virtue of its preeminently simple and absolute nature, no, he's wrong again, you see. It doesn't have a simple and absolute nature. You cannot say that of it. Free of every limitation, beyond every limitation, it is also beyond every denial. So you see, even in that somewhat shocking statement, uh, he finds himself falling into some apophatic, some cataphatic uh, statement. But then he goes, on, he goes on to say this, and also this idea is repeated in the cloud, but see to it that none of this comes to the hearing of the uninformed. Anybody want to leave? <laughs> That is to say, those, he, now he's talking, he says, don't let new age people hear of this. 
see to it that none of this comes to the hearing of the uninformed. That is to say, those caught up with the things of the world who imagine there is nothing beyond instances of individual being and who think that by their own intellectual resources they can have a direct knowledge of him who has made the shadows his hiding place. So uh, that's the, the basis then of uh, the, the, the uh, uh, which the cloud finds in Dennis. Now let's take a look at the cloud itself, cloud of unknowing. And of course you can see now where the name comes from. Cloud is really equivalent to darkness. Unknowing, of course, is unconceptualization. Um, so the author of the cloud is unknown. Of course, there's much speculation as to who he was. Uh, and I, I'm pretty sure it was a he. Uh, was he a monk or a secular priest? Um, he wrote in Middle English, and uh, it was early translated in the, into Latin. It's interesting because we don't have any of the early Middle English translations. We have some that, again, were made from the Latin. But we know he wrote originally in English and not in Latin, and basically because of one simple phrase that we find. He says, choose a word of one syllable, such as, and the Latin text says, Deus. <laughs> <laughs> so clearly it was not written in Latin. Uh, so the earliest manuscripts that we have are in Latin at the beginning of the 15th century. We know that he was familiar with Richard Rowe, and we know that Walter Hilton was familiar with him. So you can date him from these two uh, items. You can date him to the late 14th century. Uh, in terms of background of the cloud, I'd just like to quote from Johnston's uh, introduction, and we'll let it go at that. Johnston says, he belongs to a century made famous in the annals of spirituality by the names of Richard Roll, Juliana of Norwich, and Walter Hilton in England, Meister Eckhart, John Towler, and Henry Suso in Germany, Jan van Ruysbroek in Flanders, and Jacopone da Todi and Catherine of Siena in Italy. <coughs> this is an age associated with the names of Angela de Foligno, and Thomas Kempis. It is an age when, in spite of troubles and rumbling presages of a coming storm, Europe was deep, re deeply religious. Faith penetrated to the very hearts of the people and influenced not only their art, music, and literature, but every aspect of their lives. Merry England was saturated with a religious faith that breaks forth in Piers Plowman and Canterbury Tales. Chaucer may laugh good-heartedly at the foibles of nuns and friars, but he accepted the established religion with an unquestioning mind. Such was the society in which the author of The Cloud lived and wrote. Both he and his public took for granted a church, a faith, and a sacramental life that are no longer accepted without question by many of his readers today. Now, of course, one of the things that the author of The Cloud wanted to avoid, because many of the, uh, particularly the speculative, contemplative theologians fell into, uh, you know, they were almost always being herded off to be burnt at the stake or proximate to being accused of heresy. And because there is only a hairline between real contemplative understanding, say, and, and pantheism, uh, he wants to avoid suspicions and uh, accusations of heresy uh, commonly hurled at the great mystics. And this explains such chapters as uh, uh, chapter 28 on page 85. Uh, and it also, uh, he repeats this in several other places. And the title of chapter 28 is that a man should not presume to begin contemplation until he has purified his conscience of all particular sin according to the law of the church. And another chapter too, of course, he gives credence, he gives a little a little push to the divine office, but, he says, but I'm not talking about public liturgical prayers. I'm talking about, he says, personal prayer. If you ask me when a person should begin the contemplative work, I would answer, not until he has first purified his conscience of all particular sins in the sacrament of penance as the church prescribes. And so much for you, Cardinal, Manzen, uh, Cardinal uh, uh, what's his name? Uh, Ratzinger. Ratzinger. 
After confession, the root and ground from which evil springs will still remain in his heart, despite all his efforts, but the work of love will eventually heal them totally. And so a person should first cleanse his conscience in confession. But having done what the church requires, he should fearlessly begin the contemplative work, yet humbly too, realizing that he has been long in coming to it. Now, just a word on the translations of the cloud. I'm familiar with five modern translations, and I would like to, to speak just briefly of three of them. Uh, the first one uh, by William Johnston, and that's the one most of you have. Uh, it's the one I usually recommend because it's the most easily available and it's inexpensive. It's 4.95, I think, which is pretty decent for, for a book today. Uh, uh, I, I, I do have some criticism of it. I was quite surprised, actually, when I compared Johnson's translation to the Middle English copy of The Cloud and the liberties that Johnson has taken the, in his translation. But nonetheless, it's still useful, and it's readable, and, and so uh, it, it is the one I generally use. Uh, it's easily available. I sometimes recommend to people that they skip his introduction. Uh, I, I, because only for this reason that I have met so many people, I think it's 36 pages of introduction, and if you have a familiarity with scholastic philosophy, they're not a problem. But if you don't, many people have started reading, got bogged in his introduction, and never actually reached the cloud itself. Yeah. And so I say, well, you don't really need it. Read the cloud, uh, and, and just start with the cloud. And I usually also say, read the cloud through. Sit down and read it in a couple of sittings and then go back and read it a chapter a day, something like that. Now, uh, another translation which is fairly decent is Progoff's. And the trouble with Progoff's is the introduction is worse than useless. I mean, there really doesn't have any. I mean, it's just a few pages. But Progoff, now, you Progoff is the man uh, behind the journal workshops. And my understanding is that he's an agnostic Jew. And it's very interesting to see that he felt that the contemplative dimension was so necessary and important in our Western culture this day, that he made his own translation of the cloud of unknowing. I think that's very significant. Uh, and then finally, the Paulist Press, that this come out in 1981, and it has a very good introduction by Simon Tugwell. Uh, and that's also a good translation. So those three um, um, are worth mentioning. Next, I would like to speak uh, a little bit about the, uh, I think, the most important contribution that the cloud makes and that is the centrality of love in the cloud of unknown. Uh, you don't see this in, uh, in Dennis. Dennis speaks of apophatic theology, apophatic prayer, but, but uh, the centrality of love is absent, and I think it's the most significant co contribution that the cloud makes to, to Dennis. Um, I, I'd like to preface this by just a little statement of the understanding and the description of love that um, uh, William of St. Thierry gives us, and particularly in his Golden Epistle, which is so well done in, in, in uh, um, Father Wiseman's book, and, and in Light from Light. Uh, William has a wholesome and a simple notion of love. It, 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 it includes four ways, or four, you might call them four levels, uh, of four ways of seeing love. First of all, love for him is a dynamic force towards God. A beautiful description. A dynamic force towards God. That can only be love. Um, and he speaks of the four levels, or the four ways. Uh, he first of all, he is properly so-called what is love. And uh, this love, this first way, is an attraction, an inclination, a drawing of the will towards God. Okay? So that's, that's, he considers that love on the second one he calls deliction. This is also love. And what this is, is once you have the attraction, then you cling to God in, in, in union with God. And you hold on to him, you're clinging to him. So, uh, and th this, again, is love. And then he has a third way, which he calls charity. And this is once you are attracted and you cling, then you enjoy, you relish, you savor this union with God. Uh, and he calls that charity. And then the fourth level is union of spirit. This is a perfection in love. Um, if you look at the cloud, you see some beautiful expressions of this in chapter 47, chapter 49, and chapter 67. 
but always when the author of the cloud, uh, uh, well, there's one one distinction, uh, but he when he re he refers to uh, love, he's talking about any one of these four ways. Very interesting to read the cloud, and each time he uses it to uh, to look through it and and see which understanding of love he has. But they are all love. Now it's later theologians who get into the distinctions and the subdivisions and, and even also in terms of contemplative love they get into, is it active contemplative or is it passive and so forth. Uh, I think the author of The Cloud would disdain with such distinctions and such arguments. Uh, he would say that belongs to the scholars and he's not writing a scholarly book, he's writing a manual for prayer. So uh, we, we sort of agree, he and I, uh, uh, certainly on this level. Uh, Thomas Merton somewhere mentions that uh, when you start seeing theologians or hearing theologians talk about <coughs> contemplative prayer, analyzing contemplative prayer, splitting hairs in contemplative prayer, that's when no one is doing it. <laughs> <laughs> and all they can do is talk about it. I, I think there's a lot of wisdom in that. And yet at the same time, you, you can, I, I'm not quite as anti-intellectual as the cloud is. But, you know, he belongs to that, that, that devotio moderna, that, that uh, so forth. Um, so, uh, but love is... Love is primary. He calls contemplative prayer the work of love. And I have no problems whatsoever in referring to the prayer as taught by the cloud of unknowing as contemplative prayer. And some people have tried to correct me on this and say, well, it's the beginning of contemplative prayer or it's active contemplation. Nonsense. Uh, if you want to come from the tradition, not nonsense, but... If you want to come from the tradition of the church and the tradition of the cloud of unknowing, it is contemplative prayer we're talking about. Okay. How simple it is, how easy it is, how obvious it is, and, and, and what, what John of the Cross says later on or what Tankery says later on. I'm coming from the 14th century. I'm coming from the cloud of unknowing. I'm coming from the Catholic tradition, which says that this work of love is contemplative prayer. For me, that's quite satisfactory. For those for whom it is not, well, then it is not. Uh, in, in, in his brief introduction, and in chapters 1 and 2, uh, the author of The Cloud refers to love in different words 20 times, including all of the levels of, Saint, of William of St. Thierry. Take a look at the foreword on page 43, and the, even the prayer with which he begins uh, his work. There's, there's three references to love in that prayer. He says, O God, unto whom all hearts lie open, unto whom desire is eloquent. Desire is the attraction for God. It's the le first level of love, you see? And eloquent is from the word loquor, which means speaking. Love is speaking. So it's not an intellectual thing, you see? It's a volitional, a willed thing, a loving thing unto whom desire is eloquent, and from whom no secret thing is hidden. Purify the thoughts of my heart by the outpouring of your spirit, that I may love you. And again, with a perfect love, and praise you as you deserve. So three times there. In the first paragraph of the foreword, he says, Whoever you are possessing this book, know that I charge you, with a serious responsibility to which I attach the sternish sanctions that the bonds of love can bear. So even, even his appeal is on the basis of love, just to do some little thing that he's talking about. If you look at the beginning of the next paragraph, moreover, I charge you with love's authority. If you do give this book to someone else, warn them to take the time to read it thoroughly. I was novice master for six years and vocation director at Snowmass, and the novices would come in one by one with the complete works of John of the Cross under, the, under their arm, you know? And, and uh, they were all going through the dark night of the soul. <laughs> the first thing I would do is I would take it away and burn it. Uh, but, but, you know, uh, uh, because they, they, would, they were doing exactly what, and John repeats this. Uh, Dennis gets it, uh, the cloud of unknowing gets it from Dennis, who says, read everything, nothing I say can be taken in isolation. Then the cloud repeats it, and he even says in a later chapter, 
don't do anything or say anything or think anything until you've read my whole book two or three times. And then John of the Cross and the Ascent of Mount Carmel repeats it. So, you know, it, it, because you take things in isolation, and this is what some detractors, I think, of contemplative prayer do when you see them quoting isolated uh, words or, or, or statements from the cloud, um, mm -hmm. uh, which, of course, is a mistake. In page 44, uh, at the end of the, of the first paragraph, he says, to avoid a blunder like this, I beg you and anyone else reading this book, for love's sake, do as I ask. Again, in the second paragraph down, it says, however, there are some presently engaged in the active life who are being prepared by grace to grasp the message of this book. And here is really now where love comes into its own. I am thinking of those who feel the mysterious action of the Spirit in their inmost being steering them to love. And then again, he says, uh, two, three lines later, they taste something of contemplative love in the very core of their being. So um, one could go on in the next two chapters, and, and there's about 15 other references. Uh, so the, the, this permeates his book, and this is his major emphasis, and, and love is certainly has the centrality in the cloud. Well, then he comes to the end of chapter 2, and he asks this question. But, you ask, how am I to go on? What am I to do next? In other words, how am I going to uh, do contemplative prayer? And chapter 3 answers this question. And it gives a, a description of the whole process. Chapter 3 is the most complete, and I think in many ways the most beautiful chapter in the entire cloud. It's worth looking at in its entirety, and we'll finish with this. Uh, the, 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 um, it's not sufficient as a beginning instruction. I, I don't think if you sit down with someone that you're teaching contemplative prayer to and say, well, look, here it is. Let me read chapter 3. I don't think they really understand it. But someone who has been instructed, and then at the end of a workshop, perhaps, you could go through chapter 3, and then it will open itself to them and will be quite comprehensible. So I think it should be read after the basic uh, uh, description is is uh, described, and, and then one can see how it fits. So let, let me just read chapter 3 uh, on page 48 and 49. It says, How the work of contemplation shall be done of its excellence over all other works. This is what you are to do. Lift your heart up to the Lord with a gentle stirring of love, desiring him for his own sake, and not for his gifts. One could spend hours commenting on that. Uh, uh, footnote here, by the way, I, I was telling Thomas this the other day, uh, at my latest reading, I, I would love to have like six or seven days in a group of people, interested people, and just go through the cloud from cover to cover would be a great experience, but we'll do it to chapter three anyway. Center all your attention and desire on him, and let this be the sole concern of your mind and heart. Do all in your power to forget everything else, keeping your thoughts and desires free from involvement with any of God's creatures or their affairs, whether in general or in particular. Perhaps this will seem like an irresponsible attitude, but I tell you, let them all be, pay no attention to them. What I am describing here is the contemplative work of the Spirit. It is this, this which gives God the greatest delight, for when you fix your love on him, see, that is what contemplative prayer is, simply fixing your love on God. As he says later on, a naked intent towards God. When you fix your love on him, forgetting all else, the saints and angels rejoice and hasten to assist you in every way, though the devils will rage and ceaselessly conspire to thwart you. Your fellow men are marvelously enriched by this work of yours, even if you may not fully understand how. The souls in purgatory are touched, or their suffering is eased by the effects of this work, and of course your own spirit is purified and strengthened by this contemplative work more than by all others put together. Yet, for all this, when God's grace arouses you to enthusiasm, it becomes the lightest sort of work there is and most willingly done. Without his grace, however, it is very difficult and almost, I should say, quite beyond you. And then one final paragraph. 
And so diligently persevere until you feel joy in it. For in the beginning it's usual to feel nothing but a kind of darkness about your mind. Or as it were a cloud of unknowing. You will seem to know nothing and to feel nothing except a naked intent towards God in the depths of your being. Try as you might, this darkness and this cloud will remain between you and your God. You will feel frustrated. Show of hands. You will feel frustrated. <laughs> for your mind will be unable to grasp him and your heart will not relish the delight of his love. But learn to be at home in this darkness. Return to it as often as you can, letting your spirit cry out to him whom you love. And, and uh, so I, I think that's a marvelous description and requires many, many readings and, and a, a, a good bit of, uh, of uh, meditation to really fully grasp what is contained in it. So with that finishes the uh, section of the centrality of love. And then next time we'll go on to uh, for whom is contemplative prayer intended.